Hey everybody, I'm Eddie Starr, and this is the College of Rock and Roll Knowledge. Class is now in session. This is where the music and culture that shaped a generation live on and my own path through the world of rock and roll. When he picked up his acoustic guitar, the room seemed to change, and I knew there was something special unfolding in front of me. That is an excerpt from John Doe and Tom DeSavia's book, More Fun in the New World, in the chapter titled, Come on, all you cowboys, don't you want to go? by Annette Zelinskis, who was a member of Blood on the Saddle from 1982 to 1987. I met Greg Davis in 1996 at Fortress Rehearsal Studios in Hollywood, California. We became friends, and I got to see his band, Blood on the Saddle, numerous times during that period, and we even played a show together at the Whiskey A Go Go back in 1998. I also had the privilege of watching Greg, along with Andy Tomlinson from the Jubilettes, perform a version of Lefty Frizzell's Long Black Veil right in my living room. It's been quite some time since I've spoken to Greg, and in this first of a two-part podcast, we discussed how he created his guitar technique in Blood on the Saddle Sound, Punk Rock, and Johnny Cash. Greg Davis. Hi, Eddie. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm the same as I always am. Thanks uh, for your determination to do this. I'm, <laughs> I'm ambivalent about it because I'm just old and tired and grumpy. But, but I'll I'll try to have some enthusiasm. Okay. Thought, uh, you know, that's music. really funny because you know I was going to ask you first of all, right? What? I was going to ask you if you still felt that uh, you had to suffer for your art. <laughs> 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 I don't I don't know about art and I know I know too much about suffering and I'm tired of it. You know? I just, yeah. I just want to take my pain meds and take a nap, you know, basically. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I who knows? Uh I think when I was a, a young uh, musician uh, trying to make my way in the world, that I was all intense and all focused on what I was trying to do, and I was humorless. And I think in, in, in my old age that I've learned that, that I've changed my attitude. Uh, now I, I try to have a humor. Uh, I try to have a sense of humor about the ups and downs of being in a band, and you know, just just have a sense of humor about it. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I never thought that you had the impression of you that you were, uh, you know, overly serious back in the nineties. I thought well, you had a pretty good sense of humor. Well. I, I was maybe um, maybe you were. It's like you were, you know, thawing out or something. <laughs> well, I, I might have been matured a little bit between eighty three and ninety and ninety eight. You know, that's fifteen years. Yeah, but that, I didn't. I met you in ninety. I think it was ninety six. Okay, well, in the mid to late nineties. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that you remember me having a a sense of humor. I guess um, I was just saying that, you know, the question was about suffering for art, and so what I'm <laughs> trying to say is that when I was young, I was very intense about all this, and as I've gotten, you know, 40 years later, I I have a more more of a sense of humor about all of it. I mean, I'm aware of my limitations and, and I've, you know, I've done things that, that I'm proud of. And, and so I, 
I I I don't know. <laughs> I just don't want to be all intense all the time, you know. It gets old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. <laughs> It's funny to hear you talking about yourself as old and you're not old. You know, there's that old saying that, uh, you know, you're only as old as you feel. Well, what I mean is in comparison to being a young man in Hollywood in the early 80s. Yeah. You know, that was was 40 years ago, so I'm older than I was then. Yeah, okay. that's That's a good qualified answer. So uh, I guess one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was, um, which I never really had a conversation with you about, was how you came up with the sound for Blood on the Saddle. You know, there's a lot of bands and, you know, everybody pretty much, you know, in rock and roll, there's not a lot you can really do. to, uh, you know, do anything different. It's basically what you bring to it that makes it special or unique, you know, the individual that's performing. But, I mean, with Blood on the Saddle, like, uh, you really do have your own sound. And, you know, so I, I, I guess I'm most curious as to where that, came from because even if you look at you know bands that were part of you know the country punk or cow punk scene or you know it was sort of just like a it was like a variation of rock with a little bit of country sprinkled into it you know what i mean i never really thought of it as like a you know a country thing or a country punk. Whereas your thing, I mean, I I always thought of Blood on the Saddle in my mind, you know, or my experience of seeing you live and listening to your records as sort of like a square dance on acid. I understand. So I just was curious, you know, how how did you come up with that specific thing? That Uh, is Blood on the Saddle. Okay, I'll, I'll... I'll try to give you as concise an answer as I can, and that is uh, going to be impossible to be concise, but I'll try to be. My background as a musician had been uh, guitar hero, blues rock, southern rock, uh, and I... And I, when I heard punk rock, I, I didn't really like it at first. Uh, but then, but I began to appreciate that it was a reaction against the excess of the, uh, guitar hero ethic from the late 60s and the 70s, which became excessive, right? So punk rock said, wait a minute, let's go back to the 50s and how this music is supposed to sound, you know, two-minute songs and all that. So um, I, I realized when I was living in Hollywood in the early 80s and I saw all these bands while I was formulating my own uh, musical ideas, I played in a punk rock band called Dead Hippie. I played in the New Wave band uh i saw rockabilly bands like the stray cats or the blasters you know i saw punk rock bands too numerous to mention but all the los angeles ones you know um and in the early i would say in about 82 i began to uh start putting songs together that became the first album. And a catalyst for that was seeing Gun Club at the Roxy open for the Cramps and then the next week we can open for X. And they had this idea, this musical idea of taking Delta Blues and fusing with punk rock. And and that influenced me. But um, 
to, to get back to how I came up with the sound that we developed in the early 80s, it was a conscious decision to not duplicate the blues rock bass guitar lines that I had uh, been studying my whole life and make a seismic shift and take fiddle lines from bluegrass music. I lived in New Orleans in the spring of uh, 82, and I played uh, dobro uh, in a bluegrass duo on Bourbon Street, and this guy taught me how to play bluegrass. And I recognized that the vocabulary in what we would call popular rock and roll or, or punk rock, the guitar solos were were based on Chuck Berry's or or BB King Chuck Berry's double note lines or BB King's single note lines. An example of Chuck Berry's influence in modern rock would be uh, obviously to his his children, uh, Keith Richards, and the that guy in that New York band, the Heart Breakers. Uh, I can't remember his name, and and the guy from the Sex Pistols, all these, and Billy Zoom from X, all these guys duplicated all that double note thing, and I love that kind of guitar playing. It sounds great, and I love it, but it had already been taken, <laughs> and the single note BB King school, Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, Dwayne Allman, all those guys played all that. That had been taken, so I said hell with all that. Uh, I saw how it was possible to reinvent uh, a musical idiom because of, of seeing Gun Club. And I said, all right, well, if they did it, I can do it. And so I did. And so I started uh, incorporating bluegrass uh, fiddle lines, only playing them on a Telecaster through Marshall Stack. Another thing I did was I was a big fan of a style of music from the 30s and 40s called Western Swing, and uh, from the late 40s and the 50s, Hank Williams with a steel guitar, and I would take the Corsine bottle that I used to play Dwayne Allman style when I lived in the South and played Southern Rock, and instead tried to imitate the steel guitar of like uh, Hank Williams or of Western Swing. An example of this on our first album, a song called It Hurts Me, where I'm literally fusing Western Swing and punk rock. Literally, no one else had ever done that, and it's not like the world needed it or wanted it, but I but I did it. And landlord bluegrass guitar lines, ghost of my heart, bluegrass guitar lines, and then another ingredient in this musical uh, stew was like any person my age. I had grown up watching cowboy movies on TV and, and and TV shows with western themes and so I thought okay I'll, I'll I'll fuse that with punk rock I had seen this surf band play with the blasters at the whiskey called John and the Night Riders and actually I knew John's brother Richard Blair a guitar player and they had one guitar player playing surf lines another guitar playing uh Johnny Ramone style the stripped down punk rock rhythm guitar under it. And I thought, well, hell, I'll do that. Only instead of playing surf melody, I'll play TV or movie theme Western style over that. So then on our first album, we had a song, our theme song, Blood in the Saddle, not the song that Tex Ritter popularized, but our own song using that name, in which I'm, I'm, trying to make put punk rock and a TV Western theme together. We had Ghost of My Heart and Landlord where I'm playing fiddle lines on the guitar. We had It Hurts Me where I'm playing uh, like a Western swing style core scene model on the Telecaster. And so obviously I lost the ability to say, to put, be concise about this, but it was a conscious decision for me to not use my guitar hero roots in Blood on the Saddle and take elements of other music and put them with punk rock to try to make something new 
and stand out on the scene. Obviously, we, we were trying to compete with all these other cool early 80s punk or punk roots bands on the scene, and I'll be damned if I was just going to imitate them. Hell with that. I was going to be my own man. And I was, and I am, I think. Uh, your question. Yeah. No argument that for me. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty interesting because I guess at that time too you had bands. When I was, what I was referring to is you know you you had bands like the X Side Project, like the Knitters, and uh, um, you know, and then there's a certain element, sort of country element, uh, to sort of social social distortion that's sort of like grown over the years, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's real or not. I mean, if you listen to Social Distortion from back in the day, when I first saw them, to me it was just, you know, pretty much rock and roll or, you know, the straight-ahead punk rock type thing. But I think it was more of uh, Mike Ness sort of taking in that vibe of, like, the Johnny Cash thing, like – uh you know, the song Prison Bound or something like that. So I don't know if it was that, but, you know, those are the bands. I mean, they're great bands and stuff, but, uh, you know, Blood on the Saddle always had, I mean, and has a very distinct sound. And, and that whole fiddle thing that you do with, you know, taking that and applying it to the guitar, I never saw anybody play as fast. <laughs> you know, I remember, I remember sitting, uh, when we played the whiskey together and, uh, I remember standing there watching you and I just thought, man, I really don't know how to play guitar <laughs> compared to Greg. I mean, it was amazing. It was truly amazing. Well, to, that's to very see that. kind, kind of you. Um, I, I, I was talking about this uh, strictly from the guitar part point of view and didn't really bring in what Ron, Herman, and Annette contributed to the original band, which is the lineup that a, a lot of people saw in Los Angeles in the early and mid-80s because that style of music had a brief uh run as, as, a, as a fad you know there are other bands playing roughly a similar style and like all fads you know it, it died out but uh the i wanted to say that um in addition to me imitating other instruments on a on a telecaster through through a marshall uh, and playing folk or, or Western or bluegrass or film theme based lines as opposed to the blues rock guitar lines that I had played previously in other bands. Uh, in addition to that, Herman sang well. He, he sang harmony and, uh, his drumming, he, he played a mean train beat. And Ron, at first, Ron switched back and forth between playing electric bass on some songs and the upright bass on other songs. And it was after a few months of that that I made the decision, let's not be going back and forth. Just just go with the upright and and it will make us, stand out and make us be have a more original sound. And then the same thing with Annette Zelenska, when she first joined the band, we already had a set. We'd already been gigging for months while she was on tour. She was gone. And so she got added to the set song by song. Like each week we'd play another gig and she'd be on one more song. And on some of them she played rhythm guitar, um, because it just wasn't a song appropriate for a female vocal. And then some songs we sang duets or she sang in harmony to me. 
some she sang by herself, this kind of thing. So I, I want to kind of counter what I earlier said about a very guitar-centric answer to your question with giving those other musicians their their due. And it, the the musical ideas were mine, not Annette, Ron, or Herman's. But they recognized uh, that I had a musical idea that they thought was worthwhile, and then they they made a conscious decision, okay, what can I do to contribute to this? And and then they figured out what to do to contribute to it, and they all did a great job. They were they were great. Ron, Herman, and Annette deserve credit for uh, helping me um, develop that 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 sound. Cool. So going back before Blood on the Saddle, you know, a lot of musicians mm-hmm. have a record or some type of experience that you know, made them think that, wow, you know, this record blows me away or it, it sort of is like, a, you know, it, it, it becomes from, uh, well, I'm dating myself now, but, uh, you know, the whole radio experience of, oh, like hearing a song on the radio and you think, oh, my God, wow, that's that's the song. You know, and it sort of changes how you view music. And so I wanted to find out from you, like, if you were going back prior to, uh, you know, being Greg Davis in Hollywood and developing Blood on the Saddle and going to New Orleans, what were you listening to as, like, a teenager? Well, I was a product of my uh, era – uh, and the answer would be Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and Creedence Clearwater Revival and The Who and Bad Company. Obviously, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones. Uh, I, I, where I grew up in the suburbs uh, east of Los Angeles, we had very limited uh exposure to anything other than mainstream music in fact i didn't know there was anything else and it was only after i like i remember having a best of cream album and the song crossroads blues is the first song on one of the sides and then in parentheses after it it said robert johnson and i thought well this song's rocking who's this robert johnson guy and so I went to a record store and I bought a Robert Johnson record. And his version of it sounds nothing like what Cream did. Cream, Cream just did an interpretation, a, a an inspired interpretation. Uh, but it bore no resemblance to the original. Uh, he, he even, Eric Clapton even messed up the verses and sings verses from a different Robert Johnson song instead of sticking to the ones in Crossroads. It's, it's, it's just, limey foolishness but my my point is is that uh i liked what everyone else liked at the time and then as i began to study music more and more and learn about it more then i realized well all this came from somewhere and i want to know where it came from and so then i started buying old blues records and like muddy Waters or Helen Wolf or Robert Johnson, Sunhouse, and uh, that guy who did, uh, God, uh, damn it, what's it? I can't remember the names of all of them now, but there's one who used to, Skip James. Yes, that was another. Queen did a song called I'm So Glad by Skip James. I thought, well, this sounds great. So then I had to buy a Skip James record. And their version was a little closer to the original, way more so than with Crossroads Blues. Um, but anyway, what this process did was open my mind to the idea that music evolves and music can be interpreted and things, styles change and music, music, mu- music is a form of mutation. It, 
it doesn't stay, it's not static. It doesn't stay the same. It changes over time. And, and it was when I saw Gun Club that I thought, I can do this. I can do that. I, I, I knew it could be done that music could be reinterpreted and modernized and put your own identity and your own stamp on it. I knew it could be done, but I didn't think I could do it. It was when I saw Gun Club, and when I saw Gun Club, I was a poli-sci major at UCLA at the time, and I was in a punk rock band called Dead Hippie at the time. So I had some exposure to punk rock because I was trying to play it, even though I didn't really play it very well, and Dead Hippie wasn't exactly a great band. But but I was exposed to, to it. But it was it was when I made this decision, when I realized, I can do this. That's when blood, the 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 seed of blood on the cell was born. When I said to myself, "I can do this." Now, I, I know it can be done. Other people have done it, but it took a while for me to say, "I can do it." And Annette Zelenska, who was my girlfriend at that time, she recognized this in me that I had a musical idea, and that I had the musical skill to execute the idea, and she she was playing a very safe style of music with some girls from West LA and that didn't rock her. What I was doing rocked her. And so then she ended up playing, playing it with me and, and, and playing it well. You know, she was a major part of the band's success in the early days. I don't know, did I get off tape? Now where there? did you where did you grow up though? Uh, born in Pomona, junior high in Claremont, high school in Uplands. So these cities are about on either side of the Los Angeles County line, or yeah, I know where San that Manuel is. County. Yeah, it's no, because I grew up in I grew up in Cerritos, so I know where that is. Right, it's 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 Hicksville. It's only about forty or fifty miles from Los Angeles, but it might as well be a thousand. It was completely yeah, different. You know, especially probably back when, uh, back in the sixties and seventies. Yeah, it was. It was. It might as well have been on the moon. When I first moved to Hollywood, I, I was very much in culture shock. You know, it was, and when um, did you first move to Hollywood? The spring of eighty one. Oh, okay. I got my first, I got my first apartment. In, in March of 81 on Aston, which is right near the intersection of Sunset and Vine. So I was right in the middle of where all the clubs and all the, where you know, I could walk to the ca- cafe, the Grand or the Palladium or Club Lingerie, you know, all those joints. And how did you, so just to connect all that, how did you discover that you know, like, uh, what was going on in L.A. at the time, you know, like in terms of, you know, you uh, you said you were just really exposed to, you know, whatever music that was being played on the radio or, you know, mainstream type okay. thing. Okay. Okay. How, how, did, how did that sort of, how did you find out, like, uh, about okay, all this a, stuff? There was an intermediate step in all this which I haven't got mentioned yet, and that is, yes, I grew up in the, a cultural wasteland, and I had enough sense as a teenager in my late teens. I said, hell with this. I love Southern rock. I love Dwayne Allman's guitar playing in the Allman Brothers. And I met a guy from Atlanta, and he said, he was a bass player, and he said, if we go to Atlanta and play Southern rock, we can make a living. And I was a teenager and <laughs> escaping my parents and playing music in the South where the drinking age was 18 in all those southern states at that time. The Vietnam <laughs> War, because guys could be drafted at 18, they lowered the drinking age in a whole bunch of states because they felt it was unfair that guys could be sent and be killed and they couldn't even buy a goddamn beer. So they lowered the drinking age all over the South. 
So that opened up opportunities for bands to play. One, legally, you could be in one. You could you could be in a bar, you know. I mean, I wasn't really a drinker at that time, but, you know, I didn't care about it. But anyway, my point is I lived in Atlanta in 78 and in 79. And the Sex Pistols had played there, and one time we and I was in bar bands, and we would go to different states in the South and play five sets a night, five or six nights a week, covering Allen Brothers, ZZ Top, Leonard Skinner. We would do some English bands too, like Bad Company or Rolling Stones or whatever the hell. And obviously, there was new music starting to filter through a little bit in like '79. And when we were one time we were in Alabama and we were visiting a guitar player who was in another bar band who had had the audacity to actually buy the Sex Pistols album, at which which was like a no no for southern rock musicians. And he played it for us. The band I was in, we were staying at his house and, and he played the album for us. So that's the first time I ever heard punk rock was in the late seventies in Alabama in some guitar some Southern rock guitar player's living room, and I didn't really like it, but I recognized the power of it, uh, particularly the ending of the "God Save the Queen" that "No Future" part. I, I realized, you know, that's that's new, that's powerful. And another thing that I really liked, I have to say, about the Sex Pistols is that I remember the first time I ever heard an English band actually sing with an English accent. Because all those limey bands from the 60s that were imitating American rhythm and blues artists tried to Americanize their singing voices. And that guy in the Sex Pistols said, hell with that. And he yeah. he, he sang like what he was, you know. And, and to me, that was real. and And that really impressed me. I remember at the time thinking, but but I wasn't ready to, you know, I was still wanting to imitate Dwayne Allman. I wasn't re- ready to convert to, uh, to punk rock yet, but I do remember. And then uh, somehow in late 79, I ended up back in Cucamonga, and I went to see the Ramones play at a college in Claremont. And that was different because I was actually seeing it. I was actually seeing punk rock and hearing it. And that impressed me. And then I began to kind of say, say, realize to myself, you know, Los Angeles is where it's at. Music is new. New music is happening. I had this girlfriend from the South who I'd lived with in two different times in Atlanta and two different times in in California and I remember putting her on the plane and sending her back to her Baptist church mother and and saying hell with this you know I'm I'm done with southern rock I'm done with with the Baptist church I'm done with southern Dixie chicks you know and I want to move to to Hollywood and uh and investigate the music scene there you know i started going to gigs in hollywood like before i moved there you know i i would drive and uh i saw fear play the hong kong cafe um so i don't know sorry it's a long-winded answer question but i didn't just no it's great i didn't move from upland to hollywood i lived in a in a big city in the south atlanta is a major city with a music scene, with a with a a history, you know, the Almond Brothers were from based in Georgia, um, and 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 then I kind of shed all that as new music. I started hearing new bands and new musical ideas from England, and I bought the records to kind of check it out, but I didn't necessarily like it. But once I started seeing bands with my own eyes in Los Angeles, I saw X, I saw the Blasters, I saw the Plug, the Black Flag, I saw Fear and the Circle. You know, I started seeing all these bands, and then I thought, I can do this. You know, I I, I want to be a part of this. 
but it took me a while to develop my musical idea. It 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 it, it was a long uh, gestation period from seeing the Stray Cats play the Roxy in '81 or '82 until Blood and the Saddle started playing the summer of '83. You know, it was it took me a while. It, it, it wasn't easy. You know, whatever Blood on the Saddle songs you have heard or records you have heard were after the fact. At the time, I had to develop all those songs one by one. And then I had to work my girlfriend into the band. None of this was easy, you know? I I, I guess. I guess. I don't know. I think that's fair. It, It was work. It was. I had to be creative. I had to think. Well, writing, you know, writing songs is one thing, but writing really good songs and, you know, certainly Blood on the Saddle, you know, coming up with what you've, you know, your body of work, that that is a lot of work. A lot of work. It was. It was. Uh, That's um, interesting, though, that... Uh, now that part of the story I really didn't know. For some reason I didn't think that you grew up in in California. No, so that's I, really I went interesting. To, I went to Upland High School. I'm a California wow. boy. <laughs> what about Johnny Cash? What did what role did he play? Was that was that something like or um the Carter family or any of those people, how did, was that something that you were into or did that come along later? No, it didn't come along later. All that was in there for the very beginning. Uh, the first two songs I ever learned how to play when I was 11 years old, actually, when I think back now, were important for the future because one of them was Sunshine of Your Love by The Cream. And the other one was Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash. And I've been trying to reconcile those for for 50, over 50 years. You know, I've been trying to figure out, well, which, what am I supposed to play? You know, blues rock or C&W, you know? And so my dad was a carpenter from Arkansas, Eddie. You don't think I did hear country music growing up? Yeah, but All see, that's where – that see, because you said that, that's where I got confused. Because I thought you were from Arkansas. No, nah, no. Nah, I nah. thought your family, like, moved, you had grown up there or something, and you had come out to L.A. or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's Maybe okay. Maybe I shouldn't have asked you all to, those to questions. All I should have of... let the, uh, what do you call it, let the mystery grow. <laughs> no, no, my father was, actually, he was born in Arkansas, Grew up in Missouri, and he had moved to California uh, when he was young and and long before I was born. So I say that because that was his cultural influence was was Southern music. And um, when I said earlier about the kind of music I my ear was attracted to when I was growing up, and I'm saying, well popular music on the radio, uh, but going out on the housing tracks with my dad against my will to be a carpenter when I was a kid, and all those rednecks would have the radios on country music stations. So I heard Merle Haggard and, um, and Buck Owens and all and all that stuff all the time. Hank Williams, Johnny K. I heard all that. Uh, the Carter family... Though I had to kind of go out of my way to search out on my own, I don't remember my dad ever listening to the Carter family. I don't remember that. I mean, he liked songs of theirs like Wildwood Flower or or uh, that funeral song, Will the Circle the Unbroken uh, by and yeah. by, Lord, by and by. So, I mean, he was familiar with their music, but I don't remember him playing their music and me hearing it. I, I searched out those records. So once uh, I was in Hollywood in the early 81, and 
I had I hadn't been in that apartment very long before it, I had company, and that Zelenskis and I uh, we would discuss musical ideas. We would analyze what X and Gun Club and the Blasters and all these bands, Social Z, all these bands we liked, and how in the hell were we gonna uh, get something together that would complement what they did, but not imitate them? And and it was it was an easy. And so what what her and I would do would be we would go to all the uh, record stores in Hollywood and in West LA or around in Los Angeles area and strip mine the folk music section and take them back to my apartment and listen to them and think, okay, we can do this song or let's, let's take a melody from this song and then write our own words to it and say we wrote it and pass it off as a bonus metal song or, or something like this. We would, we, we, and, and I was aware that the, like the cramps would strip mine these kind of degenerate, uh, psycho Billy, proto psycho Billy songs from the South and then turn them into, into their own music. And, and a gun club was obviously strip mine. You know, we knew other musicians were doing the same thing. They were, they were strip mining American music to see what they could learn from it and see what they could use from it. And and her and I did the same thing. We did exactly the same, the same thing. We we would buy Carter Family, buy Lead Belly, Pete Seeger, Woody Guthrie, just all of that. I, I would just grab all of that, and then we would sit down and listen to it, and see uh, what we could learn from it, or um, what what we could do. There's a song called Be My Pretty Baby on the digital release of our second album. It wasn't it wasn't on the actual original second album, but on the digital release, you know, it was an outtake. And what do you do when you put stuff on digital platforms? You throw all your all, your outtakes on there. And it's very very much an example of her and I singing Carter Family Style Harmony. It's it's straight thirds and fifths the whole song. She sing every note I sing she sings, a, a third above me. So it's, it's very it's it's noticeable that how influenced we were by the Carter family on that song. Even, even the style of the melody is Carter family esque, you know. So so yeah, well it's sort of like I guess you could say from that uh, that whole period in Blood in the Saddle. It's sort of like. Um, it's sort of like you were the, you know, it's sort of like the Johnny and Jim Carter Cash thing, right? But the punk rock yes, version. And, 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 to, and, and to, say one more, <laughs> to say one more thing about Johnny Cash, uh, Annette and I went and saw him play in Orange County in January of 82. Or maybe it was February. It was either January or February of 82. And this was years before he did all those Rick Rubin kind of comeback albums. He was still basically playing to a Kmart shopping uh, trailer trash audience. And Annette and I were from Hollywood. And here we drive down to Anaheim or Orange at some convention center. And there's 5,000 5, Kmart shoppers, you know, um, it, it, and then June Carter, she came out and clog danced, and uh, it, it, it left a strong impression on us both, you know, to see how June, Johnny and June were. And Annette and me used to sing one of the most famous duets of Johnny Cash and June Carter that they're known for is the song Jackson. Annette and I used to sing that all the time. However, we never did it in Blow in the Saddle. I can't remember why. I I don't know why. We, we kind of wanted to do our own take on that kind of thing. So we tried to write songs like that and and not actually do that song. But but we knew it because, you know, like at, like at uh, family gatherings or someone's birthday party or something, and that and me would just bust out Jackson, you know. Um, so, yes, obviously uh, Johnny Cash – the beat, the rhythm, 
in his songs influenced Bloods on the Saddle. Uh, punk rock musicians were familiar with those prison albums he did, the outlaw themes, obviously that, that influenced social distortion. Yeah. Am, am, I, am I getting yeah, off You can see that. It, no, you're not. not. No, it's great. No, um, I, 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 you're, you know, you're adding context to all this stuff. I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> I, I, you know, well, you know, you, I, I guess the one thing is you, you, you know, you think you, you know, we hung out and did stuff for a lot of, you know, for a few years. And um, it's sort of funny when you think back, like, you know, I didn't know that you were from Pomona. Uh, you know, I, I, I knew some, I mean, I, I mean, I know that sounds ridiculous. Well, it wasn't maybe, something but, I wanted to advertise, Eddie. Yeah. Well, so what? A lot of people, I mean, uh, look at all the, what, well, what, uh, Joan Jett was from, uh, what was it? Uh, West Covina or something like that. So was um, Deputy Pierce from Covina. God. Uh, there was a lot of people from, a lot of people were from, uh, you know, out there, of course, the, you know, and what did what uh, Mike Ness has made a whole thing about saying how, you know, how terrible Orange County is, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's part of his, uh, you know, part of his thing or whatever. But that's pretty cool, especially the, you know, the going to see uh, Johnny Cash out in Orange County and. Oh, I know after when we went to see June Carter Cash, what, what do you think comparing those two? Because that was June Carter. That was her show. Um, but I remember after what was your impression of them on stage as opposed to what you had seen years before? So if you want to know the answer to that question, tune in next week. In the meantime, you can go to iTunes and download Blood on the Saddle's entire catalog or stream it wherever you stream music. Thank you for listening, liking, sharing, and subscribing to the College of Rock and Roll Knowledge podcast. You can now listen to all the episodes on Rumble. And Greg Davis has created a playlist to accompany this podcast. So uh, if you're on YouTube can look for the playlist. There's a link in the description box below. As well, if you are on Spotify, the link is in the description uh, for the podcast, as well as Rumble. So thank you so much. Eddie Stars, the College of Rock and Roll Knowledge, is a production of Ton Up Incorporated. Copyright 2021, Ton Up Incorporated.